Oh, oh, he's funny. Oh, she's a good performer. Oh, I must buy a ticket for that one. Hello there. Every year, over two billion performers descend upon the Edinburgh Festival. For most, it will end up in insurmountable debt, crushed dreams and death. But for some, they will get the chance to perform in a TV executive's panel show. Or perhaps do their show in front of art centres up and down the whole of the country. Welcome to the first in a series of 8,000 interviews in which I'll be speaking to various experts to give you a comprehensive all-round look at the fringe, the best one ever made. We shall begin by talking to a man who calls himself a comedian. Beneath the fringe. Genetically inherited, fairly hairless legs. Anyway, here we are at Beneath the Fringe, and I'm joined today by Greg Davis. Um, well, it's nice to finally meet you, Greg. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. I've heard a lot about you. Yes, I've heard a lot of things about you, and thank you for taking the time to um, come on to this show and talk about Edinburgh. It's my absolute pleasure, Marek. Um, uh, so let's start off. Um, <laughs> tell me, is doing the Edinburgh Festival really the quickest way to get on Loose Women? <laughs> So you went last year and with your show, and you yes. um, you you did you got nominated for the Fosters Award. I was. Um, tell me, <laughs> can you say what was the best and worst of the whole experience? Mm, I think the worst of it was the first two days where I where I think I knew that my show wasn't really as good as it should be, probably, mm. and. Uh, and I did it a couple of times, it was fine. And you came to see it and said, it's not as good as it should be. Uh, yeah. And it was, uh, yeah, it was genuinely quite frightening, actually, when you realise it, it just hasn't, we were the same with Clang, weren't we? It hadn't mm. come together at the right time. And then, anyway, I, that was the worst moment when I thought, oh, Christ, you know, critics are going to start coming in soon. And if you get slagged off early doors and no one comes to see your show. But do you think that's a massive, that's a huge point of you can only be successful if you do have that moment, like we had with Clang, when you realise this is awful and you actually admit that it's rubbish? Because yeah. some people seem to just say, oh, I've done my Edinburgh show in, um, <laughs> I've written it all in June, I've done it, it's all set. Can and I, then they don't... Um, can I lean back? Yeah. And they don't, and they don't even change it at all. So I think that's quite... It's, and it did improve. I think it's a big... I think it's a big part of it because it... It sort of has a rules of its own up there, and and the room has an atmosphere of its own that you're in the space, and so if you're lucky enough not to get critics in for the first two or three days, and you get chance to make it better, that's great. And I did, luckily, I had chance to spend all day changing things and adding to it. Mm. So I think that the show got like 20% better in the first two days. I think. Mm. So when you finished, it was on what percent? 35%. 35% good. A, that's pretty good for yeah. a show. Do you think you need to go to the Edinburgh Festival to have a successful comedy career? No, I don't think you need to go, but I do think that it is pr probably the most relevant comedy festival in the world. So I do think it makes a, a difference and that people... <clears throat> you know, really important people in the industry do go there. And if you're a success up there, it, it, it makes a big difference in the industry. What I don't think is that the rest of the United Kingdom cares about it. I think a lot of comics have made that mistake of, uh, of doing really well in Edinburgh and then com coming back and thinking they're all conquering heroes. And I don't think the public are a long way from that. Mm. But in terms of in industry, getting industry people to notice you, then I think it's the best way in the world to do it. Some would say. Yeah, but what if I'm painting my balls blue? Yeah. <laughs> so, more questions then. How do you think Edinburgh's changed? I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have put two Maltesers in my mouth just before we were about to start. I thought you were going to go and look at that. And would you go back again? Hmm. I don't know. I think I said it to you. You said... I will never, ever, yeah. ever go back again. I can swear in my life, if I go back again, you can literally shoot, shoot me in the face and shoot all my future children if I ever but I think agree it, to go back to Edinburgh. I think I might have said that in the heat of the stress of no, Edinburgh. You said that about three... You said it to me daily. You phone me up and tell me that. I saw you wrote it on um, my face. 
I'll tell you what I think about it. Do you mind? And I, think, mind? I think I said this to you. Uh, is I think that you get the feeling after you've been to Edinburgh for a, for a few years. I got the feeling that it kind of belongs. It, you don't belong there anymore. It like belongs to other people. Yeah, the younger bunch. And I know there's lots of stalwarts who go there every year and have been since the 80s, and that's really great, but I kind of felt like, oh, I shouldn't really be here anymore. Mm -hmm. I should be putting my energies into other things, but I could be wrong, you know, probably maybe I'll be up there next year. It's certainly intoxicating. What's been the best moment in my career? Um... Well, I, inevitably, it's when you... Uh, the, times you're nominated isn't it you know yeah. it's just really exciting you remember when we got nominated for clang it was it's sort of a tangible reward for all your hard work mm. and you know for all the slagging off of critics and stuff it's also really exciting if you get a good review mm. uh, you know what i should say is it's just doing the show mate just doing you know knowing that i've coming up to edinburgh and thinking it doesn't matter what anyone says or what rewards given now i know this show's good but that's not true it's really nice to win and for somebody else to write down that they think you're good and why they think you are. Yeah, you could just do it yourself, couldn't you? Make your own award. I did that. It it's not as reward. It's not as rewarding though. And was it w weird? Is it not? What's the feeling like of not uh, winning the award, getting nominated, and not winning? Uh, it's all right. I think. Mm. I think it's just about being nominated. Really, it's just nice that you've been recognised in that way. I so, didn't. I didn't. No, I wasn't at all upset about not winning. You've been nominated twice. Were you? Not. Um, well, we knew we hadn't won before we even got there. How did we know? Because of the face of the people, the judges, just oh, can't yeah. look you in the eye. Hello. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, well good done. luck. You're well done. Oh right, well, I see. <laughs> and then when you know, when you which know, is, which is what you said out loud. All yeah. oh, right, I see. <laughs> oh, that's the way it is, is it? All oh, right, I'm gonna get pissed. And then everyone <laughs> says, um, "Oh, good luck, good luck." And you know you haven't won. Yeah. Because the winner, when we got nominated, the uh, absolutely brilliant Phil Nickel, uh, was was uh, told to stand near the stage <laughs> during, during the thing. <laughs> so we thought, that's strange, isn't it? Phil's been asked to stand near the stage. Yeah. Why is Phil... Uh, why is someone doing <laughs> Phil's hair and putting makeup on him? I mean, is that... Why, why, why is Phil punching the air? Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it might be quite nice. Just Phil's to... really brilliant, by the way, and... Uh, a thoroughly deserving winner. Just throw that in, in case this ever goes onto the internet. Because you've almost won, I'd like to present you with a special award that I've made, which is a combination of the greatest... Um, uh -huh. The greatest Edinburgh Awards in one. The Professor's Award. That's <laughs> lovely. And can I keep the Professor's Award? You can keep the Professor's Award. And would you like to say anything to um, the general public about the Professor's Award? I think that... That this makes up for for not winning either the Fosters or the Perrier, just being nominated, being nominated for those was exciting. But actually winning the Fosters Award, mm. which for some reason has tape round it with gas written on it. Yeah, well, where'd, where'd you get that? Well, I just steal it from. It was the only thing I could find on the way here. And uh, select and save, sixty nine pence. Yeah, well, the good thing about it is you've got two drinks there, um, in one. Why are you giving me this award for comedy? I just thought it would be quite nice if you'd have something to keep. But what, are you doing it for my show or just for my general contributions to comedy? Just your general contributions to comedy, because I think you've contributed more to, uh, to comedy over the course of the Perrier and the Foster's uh, the Foster, sponsorship yeah. than anyone else. You should be the first recipient anyone else of the, the, the Foster's Award. Yeah, you, and then second, I'd say... Um, who can I say that's not going to beat me up? Um, yeah. I, I almost feel guilty being the person who's won the first and I suspect last and only ever Buffusters Award. Thank you very much. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Greg. It was nice to meet you, finally. It was really nice to meet you, Marek, as well. And good luck um, with all your future performances, be there in Edinburgh or, or you know, um, <laughs> or whatever you want to do. All right, then. I guess we should call it a night. Beneath the fringe.